great. You know, first of all, I want to thank uh, Finos for hosting this session. We're very excited to be here. My name is David Eric, and I'm the executive director of AIR, which is the Alliance for Innovative Regulation. Uh, and I'm here with my uh, good friend and colleague, Ian Hollowbread from ING. Ian, do you want to just give yourself a quick intro? Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Ian Hollowbread, and I head up um, IN RegTech at ING Labs, um, and it's an initiative which we started uh, roughly a year and a half ago uh, to really uh, develop an uh, emerging technologies to solve um, and promote emerging technologies to solve uh, real business problems. Um, and we're progressing uh, these technologies across the industry uh, and very much internally within our organization as well. That's great. And um, uh, we're here today, and, uh, and Ian in particular, uh, you know, one of the areas that we both work on very closely is this notion of regulation innovation, which many people think is an oxymoron. And uh, together, we've been trying to uh, really uncover the ways in which regulation in the regulators across the United States and uh, jurisdictions around the world uh, are beginning to innovate. Uh, and I wonder if you could say a few words, Ian, on, on what you see as the kind of global trends in innovation today. Yeah, I think uh, as an industry, obviously, we all struggle to, to meet the consistent change in demands of, of regulation. For an organization like ING, we operate in 40 plus markets um, and it, global regulation is constantly changing in those markets. And it's how do we address those changes and how do we ensure we are compliant with those changes together and, and I think what we've seen in the past is, is we've seen regulators take a, a very proactive approach in terms of innovation we've seen financial institutions take a proactive approach in terms of innovation um, and we've seen startups and, and, and reg techs emerging which which solve fundamental problems but but it's a very fragmented environment and and we think actually it's an environment where we believe that open source can really help drive and, and promote sustainability in the industry. And really it, it's one place where we can access all together rather than um, these kind of point and isolated approaches from different regions and different geographies. Um, open source by its nature allows everyone um, to participate and everyone to benefit from this. So th th this really, uh, our, our hope that this group uh, and uh, we hope that uh, people join us on, on this journey to really promote the, the great work that's already going on in open source in the industry and, and new work that we can potentially build upon. So for those of you who are just joining, uh, Ian and I have been uh, the co-leads for the new special interest group, the new SIG on RegTech. Uh, and we're really excited to share that with you. And we hope that uh, you'll come and join us at our next meeting, which is going to be on Tuesday, November 24th. And you can get the information in uh, the GitHub. Um, but uh, as a context for the conversation that we want to have today, we have uh, two guest regulators with us, uh, or at least we are hoping to have two guest regulators with us. Uh, and both of these regulators are regulators that uh, have really established uh, regulation innovation as a primary uh, priority for their agencies. And they have uh, been really forward thinking and have been uh, exercising new tools to try to help regulators and regulatory agencies really engage with new technologies. And some of those tools that we're gonna to be touching on today include uh, sandboxes and tech sprints um, uh, and, and other topics that we're going to be, uh, that we're going to be looking at. Uh, you know, Matt Lowe, I wanna kind of just uh, pass the baton over to you as a representative from the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. I think the FCA has really been recognized as a thought leader in uh, regulation innovation. And I wonder if you could share with us a little bit about uh, how you think about your uh, regulation innovation strategy and the tools that you have been pioneering and using to uh, to drive regulation innovation. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so where I come from uh, within the whole innovation department within the FCA, I, I sit within what's called the RegTech and Advanced Analytics um, team, which we look at um, innovation in terms of what we call subtech, which is like your internal uh, development and, and the tools that you might create for the regulator to use. And we also uh, look at reg tech. And part of the 
the um, the program for the RegTech team is we um, host these things called hackathon or tech sprints, which is essentially just a fancy word for a hackathon. Um, it, they um, sorry the the dogs are going to go off in a minute, so we might have a, a bit of noise in the background. But um, but anyway, the the whole point of a hackathon is to try and bring together some industry experts who um, who work on on a particular uh, problem or, or solution that we might want to, to try and build out over a period of, of say two to three days. Um, our journey has been one that's probably taken around about five years to get to where we are now. Uh, and when we first started this program, we started off with like smaller events. We had maybe 20 to 40 individuals. Uh, they, were, they were quite open in terms of like the participants we'd bring in, but we'd only, we'd, we'd, we'd be a little bit more free in terms of like um, what, what problem we're trying to solve. As we've gone through that journey and, and we've now done seven tech sprints, it's got more complicated and it's got bigger. So um, if I was to give you an example of the one we did on money laundering and financial crime, which we worked with AIR last year on, um, we had approximately 180 participants and that was during the actual duration of the tech sprint, went for three days. And then on the final day, we had a further C-suite of another probably 200 uh, participants who were actually seeing some of the solutions that have been developed. Now, the whole objective there was to try and look at um, how we could uh, open up data sharing between different institutions using something called privacy enhancing technologies. And, um, and what we wanted to do is see if we could unlock those technologies to try and you know, combat money laundering and financial crime. Um, sorry, go on, David. No, I was just going to say that event in the US was a watershed event. The uh, tech sprint on uh, any money laundering, which was really focused on human trafficking, was the first time that uh, US regulators had an opportunity to see a tech sprint firsthand uh, in the US. So uh, uh, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, my organization partnered with, with the FCA, with you guys, uh, to actually deliver that tech sprint in the US. And it was an extraordinary moment because the regulators get to see firsthand the kind of collaboration that takes place when you bring together a technologist with technology expertise and a subject matter expert. The subject matter expert doesn't have visibility or awareness of what technology can provide. And technology doesn't have visibility onto the kinds of challenges that uh, regulators are facing. So when you bring them together and sit them down at the same table and provide them with an intensive problem solving uh, opportunity over a short period of time where you're required to deliver a particular um, prototype, uh, what happens is explosive. It's really exciting and really uh, engaging for the participants. And it, it's an incredible tool to build collaboration and to build, um, uh, to break down the silos between different stakeholders that really don't spend enough time together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's something that we've, um, we've noticed that, and that's why I think they get so big and the, because the, the industry see that, you know, this is a great way to convene, to try and solve those problems. And, you know, those private public uh, partnerships start to form. So, um, so yeah, they've been really useful for us as a regulator to try and so tackle some of those bigger problems. Um, we obviously, we are in a different world now with COVID and uh, it, doing something in a physical location is not, not possible uh, at the current point in time. So, you know, we're exploring ways of doing things virtually and, um, and I guess the latest thing that we've done, which is virtual in the sense of trying to innovate is uh, what we did with the, the data sprint earlier this year but had a slightly different objective where we try to create some data sets for the, the digital sandbox. But we can talk about that a, a little bit later. Well, why don't we spend a minute talking about what uh, the key learnings have been from tech sprints? I mean, the FCA has done seven or eight tech sprints, did you say? Yeah, so we've done seven tech sprints and one data sprint, I guess. So in uh -huh. hackathon style events, we've probably done eight, just slightly right. different models. Um, and what are the key learnings? So I, I guess, uh, well, you can actually go to our website and there's, uh, there's a paper that's called Fostering Innovation Through uh, Collaboration. And that, that goes through some of the key learnings that we've got from, from the tech sprint model. Um, and it talks about like some of the issues that we face in terms of trying to bring together uh, the, the environments, like the data, uh, trying to get together the right people into the room, setting up like industry working groups to, to, to help being that subject matter expertise throughout the event. Um, and also, I guess, some of the learnings that we have found, this will play somewhat into the digital sandbox and there might be a bit of flow here, but essentially what we found is that we do this really good event that goes for two to three days. It's fantastic. You get a lot of buzz, you get a lot of energy. And then like on the last day, we almost shut down the whole environment. So 
all the um, all the participants lose access to the data, they lose access to the environment, uh, and then, then it's then I mean we do play some role in observing some of the proof of concepts that come out of it, but what we find is that we can lose some of that momentum. So what we're looking to do is explore other ways that we can keep the infrastructure up and keep the data there, and 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 then you can continue to develop going forwards. So like one key, go on. Sorry, Matt, I think that's a great way to like kind of segue into the work that we're trying to achieve in, in Finos, because actually that, that those that learnings and outcomes, we believe some of that can can move into an open source kind of uh, approach and an open source model and, and, and where we're looking to take it um, is, is so there's, there's a continuous work and continuous development in some of these initiatives, which may have been proved out by by some of your your excellent work within the tech sprints and I think like some of the aspects you talk about around getting the communities together and the collaboration together like then, then there suddenly becomes a, a, a landing spot across the globe that al allows these these projects if they're open by nature to to really be put the boundaries to be pushed uh, and asked to continuous work along these 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 initiatives because I, I've experienced the learnings from the tech sprints that you've done and i think they're great but obviously we need to continue like you say that momentum yeah and we need and we need to have the right tools to be able to you know continue that work and you know if that's finos or if it's the digital sandbox environment that we're looking to create then there needs to be the tools for innovators to come in and continue some of that really good work to go from proof of concept to proof of value so they, they, they're actually developing something and then they're able to demonstrate further develop beyond the the, the boundaries of a tech sprint. I think I see our other guest here. We have a guest regulator from the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and Jennifer Lassiter, is that you? Hi, I'm here, I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, and we can hear you. That's perfect. So um, okay. Jennifer, we were just talking about uh, tech sprints and how uh, regulators have been using tech sprint as an innovation tool. And uh, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau in the US has just been uh, working on uh, creating a, a tech sprint strategy. And just last month in October, you mm -hmm. launched your first tech sprint, particularly on consumer disclosures. And I was wondering if you could share with us about that experience and what some of your key learnings were from that. Oh, sure. Um, so I, I first must say it's such an honor to be on the panel um, with these folks. Um, and the reason that that's relevant is because a lot of the tech sprint work that the Bureau did in preparation and execution in October was because of the pioneering that the FCA did, their publishing of their tech sprint paper, and then also um, the toolkit and tech sprint manual that AIR um, published following FCA's paper and is available on AIR's website. So thank you to both of those organizations for really giving us a great roadmap to follow. Um, I would say in terms of uh, additional boxes that needed to be checked before we could embark on the tech sprint, um, really getting the buy-in from senior leadership at the Bureau. Um, and what I mean by buy-in is um, agreement and understanding and the potential value for tech sprints as a model for interacting um, with regulated institutions and industry and other audiences that the Bureau serves. Um, and that was a big lift. And I have to applaud Director Kraninger um, because it really was signing off on something that didn't have a, a very neatly predicted outcome and signing off on something with an unpredicted outcome that would have a very public facing impact. Um, so we, we received permission from her to move forward forward in January of this year, and we have three goals for our program. Um, one is to, and I'm going to read these to be accurate, develop actionable technology-focused solutions to a variety of regulatory and consumer protection challenges. Two, harness technology to reduce burden, improve results, and create greater efficiencies across financial markets. And three, explore how technology can reshape compliance and speed effective interaction between regulators and financial institutions. Um, so in many ways, the Bureau was really set up to run fast and hard towards these goals. We have an open source by default strategy in place, um, and it has been for a long time, thankful, thankful to a um, very very innovative development team led by our development lead, Adam Scott. Um, so we started off, and I will just say, 
we got the sign off from the director in January. We used the summer. Um, in June, we announced the problem statement. We used the summer for recruitment and to refine the problem statement and do the logistical planning. And then um, we executed in October. And we ended up with 13 teams and 82 participants, which was far beyond what we anticipated when we started off on this initial journey. Um, we thought, start small, don't bite off more than we can chew. Um, but the appetite was so strong um, in terms of our external audiences wanting to interact with a regulator in this way. And it really was promising. Um, and then after we executed in October, um, there's a couple, uh, we had a couple goals that we were looking for. One, just execute the week, make it through the week, no technical difficulties. Um, two, we wanted to push industry to innovate on adverse action notices, um, give them an incentive to pay attention to this topic. Um, and three, we wanted to modernize. We wanted to demonstrate and strengthen this model of collaboration. Um, we wanted to spur application to our Office of Innovation Trial Disclosure Program. And um, which is near and dear to my heart, we wanted to prove that there's value in this process, that we could be creative with um, industry, and then we could pay that creativity forward into data for policymaking purposes. Um, I'm happy to talk about how we've achieved those goals, but I don't want to be a time hog. So, David, you tell me what's best for this discussion. Well, you know, I think to highlight some of the points that you were making is uh, how powerful the collaboration was. You know, I got a, an email from yeah. one of the participants in the, the CFPB tech sprint where he uh, opened up with, I am a tech sprint convert. <laughs> Um, Woo! Because of, uh, <laughs> how fun and creative these environments are and how they really unleash people's problem solving and creative juices. And it's a, it's, it's really a remarkable uh, process. If you have not been involved in a hack hackathon or a tech sprint, I highly recommend it. Um, but one of the and things- I think what, what's the great thing is, the other great thing is that it's, it's beginning to demonstrate like real impacts as well. Like, and it's actually actionable um, actions coming out of these. Like if you look at the, the FCA and Matt's work, there is actual a sandbox now environment that firms can really participate on. So whereas before, like you mentioned, they closed down, like with Jennifer's work, like there is an action like of an open source nature coming out from it so that we can all, all learn and benefit from it. So there's really actions um, and we're moving away from the, those talking points to actually what, what can the industry benefit from this and what can financial institutions, what can regulators and what can the startup communities um, benefit. And I think that's, that's the big difference um, as we've gone through the, the evolution and the innovation journey um, today. And Matt, you have, I don't know if this is public information, but you've launched the application process for uh, the DigiSandbox. And um, I understand that you've been overwhelmed with, uh, with uh, requests for participation. Yeah, um, I can go one step further, David. We've launched the application process. So we've closed the application process down. Uh, we actually received 94 applications, which is, um, we had a little running bet wow. within the office about how many we would get. I said 75 was off by about 20, so I lost. But, um, but essentially, yeah, it was a big success in terms of like how many, it, that shows that the industry are looking for something like this. Um, we can only accept 30 in, um, and we've just decided who they are, and they will get notified on Monday. Uh, and then from there, we give them access to the environment from the 23rd uh, of this month. Um, and what, what that gives them access to is a series of features in terms of similar to what you provide in a, in a, in a text print, uh, synthetic data assets, which, we went with, which we've gone to great lengths to create uh, and try to make as, um, as realistic as possible. Uh, and in terms of like the sorts of data assets that we're looking at, we've created five fictional UK banks, which covers um, around about 400 million transactions over the course of a year. Uh, we've created like, I guess a synthetic world, which looks somewhat like the UK, but um, but a little bit different. And I kind of always turn this in the way, I don't know if anybody's a Game of Thrones fan, but at the start of Game of Thrones, you see this opening sequence and it looks kind of like medieval UK or Europe and and then, it, it, but it doesn't. And that's kind of like what we're trying to create with this synthetic data asset. So we've shrunk down the UK population to, uh, to about 7 million synthetic individuals uh, that, that represent demographically what the, um, what the UK looks like. 
And then we're making that all those data assets available to solve these three use cases that we're going after for the for the pilot itself. And so that's like one feature. And then there's other features in, in terms of like collaboration features and, and anybody can register and have a look and see what the teams are doing within the environment. So there's an opportunity for them to showcase some of their work. Um, there's also an opportunity for people to connect. So we've created a lot of, um, a lot of collaboration features. Uh, so originally I was kind of terming this as like the, the Amazon for reg techs and fintechs. And now I'm kind of terming it, the, the term I'm using, it's like the LinkedIn for fintechs and reg techs and combining that all together to make this, um, this really valuable product. That's great. What kind of dog do you have? I have two. Noisy ones. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, David will put his cat up in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are watching, uh, I have a cat who likes to sit on my shoulder, but he's uh, he's busy at the moment. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, both of you uh, at the FCA and at the CFPB, you've both had a tremendous opportunity to explore tech sprints and, and really see the benefits of tech sprints, but you've also had to engage the challenges of actually setting up a tech sprint and mm -hmm. overcoming some of the challenges of, um, you know, bringing market participants in to work with regulators. And so, you know, starting with the CFPB, Jennifer, what kind of challenges did you face when you were kind of engaging market participants and trying to uh, promote participation in the tech sprint? Sure. Um, so I think um, I must applaud our tech sprint team because they made over a thousand phone calls in the month of July um, to various audiences in the U.S. Um, to talk about the problem statement and the tech sprint as a model. Part of it was because we had originally planned to host it as a traditional tech sprint format in the spring before COVID-19 hit. And then we moved to a virtual format and we wanted to understand uh, what people would be looking for in terms of engaging in a virtual manner um, with uh, the intent of still achieving the same outcome. We also wanted to pressure test with them the problem statement and make sure that it was a problem statement that they were interested in and capable of tackling. We wanted to stress to them that we were not looking for companies to come and apply as company X to participate in the sprint. We wanted um, people to, uh, teams to be multidisciplinary um, and have a variety of experts around the table uh, contributing to the problem solving that week. I would and I will say the, um, the softer side of the conversations and concerns that we heard, which I think were just as critical as those logistical pieces I just discussed, were what is in it for me as an institution or an individual to participate in this sprint? Why would I want to do that? Um, I'm afraid that I'm opening myself up to regulatory scrutiny if I participate in this space with you. Um, what kind of media and publicity might my institution receive if it is heard that we are collaborating in this way with a regulator? So I think, um, I think those questions are very real and it's really important to speak directly to them when you're talking to people and generating interest and engagement around um, a particular tech sprint. Yes, I think that um... Uh, you know, AIR just recently produced a tech sprint on cryptocurrency and its ability to limit the distribution of child sexual abuse materials. And, uh, you know, while we heard that, uh, you know, from participants that this was, you know, really a life changing event to be involved in something that was so mission driven and had such high impact for, you know, for individuals. Uh, at the same time, you know, you're, you're, you're trading off many different risks. Uh, in terms of, of participation, especially uh, when you're a, a covered entity working with the regulatory body. You know, Matt, what are some of your experiences uh, having produced so, so many different tech sprints? What's some, what are some of your experiences in trying to convince market participants to participate? Uh, it's funny enough, it's always, um, I'm always surprised about how, how many participants we do get that are generally interested in trying to solve these problems. Um, I'm always, uh, we always get to a stage where we're having to knock a lot of people back. And, and, and that's generally, I think, because they, um, the, the, the people that want to get involved in solving these problems, and especially when it comes to something like money laundering and financial crime, it's, um, it's, some, it's a very big problem. It's a global issue. 
uh, it needs to be um, it needs a global effort. So to actually reach out to that community, um, it, I found it quite easy to, to to bring them all in. Don't get me wrong; there have been tech sprints that haven't been as successful, and, and maybe they're not as um, as appealing when it comes to uh, the actual use case or problem statement. Um, we had done one previously, which uh, was quite difficult to generate a lot of uh, interest. Uh, and maybe the topic wasn't as interesting as money laundering finance crime, but if the use case is compelling enough, you will find you, you, you can convene the industry um, to, around that particular problem. Uh, it also gives them an opportunity to show off some of their, their technology to a broader audience. So we always, um, you know, I sort of briefly mentioned this before, like the C-suite on the last day where you present these solutions, uh, it's, that's really important in terms of like trying to make sure that there's an audience which can, can go some way to either help push the, the development of that product further or, um, or just in general to start making some of those connections and, and, and getting the whole industry to work around that, that problem outside of the realms of the tech sprint. Yeah. And um, can I, David, can I just add a comment there, which is um, one of the, the um, flip sides is when you extend your reach outside of just um, covered entities or regulated entities, and you start to include your community advocates and um, other community, um, for us, consumer-based organizations, um, they, it makes a very interesting conversation. So for our evaluation panel, we had representatives um, across the board, including community advocacy. And um, it, what it did was invite a conversation that I think normally wouldn't happen around the tensions of a particular application of technology. And for the Bureau, it's very important to hear those conversations play out and understand the perspectives of those respective constituencies and um, be able to take that into consideration as conversations unfold internally around application of uh, that information in the rulemaking process. Um, so I don't know of another space, um, at least one that is that public where you have um, those two bodies of people who don't normally come together to collaborate on a topic um, in a non-combative way. Um, and I found that to be very valuable. So Ian, I wonder if this is uh, a moment to pivot. We've spoken a bit about the um, uh, kinds of innovation tools that regulators are, are beginning to embrace. And um, uh, you know, one of the challenges that we talked about earlier is, is how to make sure that those uh, innovation exercises live on and uh, have an opportunity to gain traction. And one of the ways to do that is through open source. And Ian, I wonder if you could you know, revisit the uh, comments that you made a little bit earlier about the role of open source here, particularly for regulators and the interaction of regulators and, and market participants. Yeah, I, I mean, Jennifer, I think I, I mentioned this before, but what I was saying earlier is obviously it's great the work that the FCA are doing and it's great the work that you're doing, but actually for in firms that are international by nature, a multi-geography, then there's not always the same level of like maturity in, in, in regulation innovation. But actually those, those global firms want, need to adopt like standards and, and need to meet the regulatory requirements. And how do you, how do you, man like we need to report to, I don't know, 40, 50 different, um, different regulators. So how do you ensure that like these, these, we do that successfully. And I think uh, what we believe, that the work that's coming out of Finos, and we've seen financial institutions uh, put their code into open source and a data modeling code. And we've seen the work that's been going on in the FDC3 interoperability working groups across different domains that not necessarily regulation, but potentially the impact, if you put that on regulation, could be significant. And, and if there's a place and the work that Finos is doing and, and is driving from an industry perspective, if there's, you can open that in, in the compliance risk and regulatory domains, then we think that there's significant, um, significant gains that can be made from an industry as a whole. Uh, and some of these, whether it's the tech firms or whether it's the the, the financial institutions or even if it's the regulators that actually there's a place that we can share internationally um, for the benefit of all. 
And, and Jennifer, you know, I know that the CFPB, for those of you who aren't familiar with the different U.S. regulatory agencies, the CFPB is the newest of the U.S. Regulator, regulators to be stood up. And, you know, one of the benefits of being a new regulatory agency is that they are not hindered by the legacy technology and the legacy risk that many of our uh, financial institutions and financial regulators are are, are kind of um, strapped with. And, you know, Jennifer, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the history of open source at the CFPB and how, uh, you know, the CFPB uses open source today. Well, I'm not going to talk about the history specifically because I'm going to encourage everyone to come to the conversation after this where my two bureau colleagues will join me in having that exact discussion. So a little bit of a teaser if you haven't teaser chosen your future. session yet for <laughs> noon. <laughs> but I will say... Um, I will say in how it's used today. Um, so I posted in the Slack channel, I forget which channel it is exactly, but the one that um, pertains to policy and regulation, um, CFP, a link to CFPP's GitHub. On that GitHub, you will see all of our open source work. Um, please feel free to comment. Um, and uh, I will say that where we are today is that we are in a place where we are open source by default. So there are certain um, there are certain criteria that if they are checked, then there is a conversation about not having open code. Um, but for the most part, um, we are approaching situations that we will be coding in in the open, and we will encourage participation and feedback from the public accordingly. Um, one of the places where we've seen cross agency collaboration, um, and we're hoping to pick it up and encourage it further is around our interactive regulations work or our machine readable regs. And this is work that we had started. Um, every time I say this, I surprise myself, but about eight years ago, and um, really kind of um, pioneered the space of how do we uh, make regulations machine readable. And of course, the de definition for how they are machine readable um, varies now from what it is now from what it was eight years ago. But um, that code is open and, and we have seen other agencies in the U.S. work with that code and apply it internally. Um, and it still is used as foundational code in, in a few agencies to this day. Um, so we'd like to do more of that. And um, that open source application, I can't remember earlier today, I think I heard someone say we really want to build off of each other. Um, one of the things that is special for the Bureau is that we also have an in-house full stack dev team um, that is about 40 people uh, for federal full-time employees. And then we supplement with um, an almost equal number of contractors. Um, no other regulators that I know of in the U.S have that kind of staff available to them as full-time federal employees. And um, that is a resource that I think if we can figure out how to kind of build off of each other's work and leapfrog from our various efforts, um, that we will be able to share with the rest of the regulatory community. Um, so we shall see what the future brings. I think it is bright. And, and Matt, you, the FCA has also been a pioneer in machine executable and machine readable. Uh, regulation. And I wonder if you could share with us um, uh, the story of the tech sprint that you did on, on that. Yeah, so um, we were exploring um, what we now call digital regulatory reporting, it was called MDMER or something, which was, was a bit of a mouthful to say at the time. So we shortened it somewhat. Um, but yeah, we did explore that in, the, in a tech sprint back in November of 2017. This was before I joined the team. So, you know, I've, I've just got to try and um, pull together some of the information I know from, from, from my prior knowledge. But essentially we went through, we did a tech sprint. We tried to prove out that you could actually, um, that machine readable, um, machine executable reporting could be done. Uh, and the final day we, we demonstrated that with by, by, by changing um, uh, one of our uh, policy uh, instructions. And then that actually pulled in different data uh, according to that. So, so we did, we, could, we proved that it could work. Um, then we ran a, a series of pilots. We, we did two pilots and we, um, we expanded on the, the scope of, of the actual uh, proof of concept to try and bring in some, fur some further data. And then um, it's now in a position where we're actually looking to try and integrate that within the FCA internally. 
now it's not so open source um, as say CFPB, but what we're looking to do is, is think about sharing our, at least our learnings on uh, what, with the Bank of England and uh, with, our, with ourselves and the GFIN community so that we can look to expand some of that work as well. You know, we're an acronym free zone here. So oh, sorry, so Global Financial say, Innovation Network. Which is what? It's, uh, so it's, a, it's, it's a, I guess, a community of regulators, an international community of regulators who, who are getting together and, you know, we just discuss things like um, supervisory tech or reg tech uh, and, and, and actually look at some cross-border testing. So it's, it's got quite a broad scope, uh, but it brings, it's quite unique in terms of like the conversation across the uh, international community. Yeah, that's excellent. You know, uh, my co-founder at AIR, Joanne Barefoot, was at the tech sprint in 2017. I think that it's commonly referred to as the moonshot. And um, uh, it, she likes to say that it, you know, what, what was amazing was when they finally executed the code and it actually came through, you had a participating bank that was able to actually develop a report based on code, you know, code that was delivered as regulatory requirements. Uh, and when it actually executed, the entire room filled with regulators and compliance officers cheered. <laughs> and when do you see regulators and compliance officers in a room cheering together? It's a very unusual sense. Yes, so, something's gone right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, and I think you can actually see that on the website as well. There, there is the video and at the very end of that, um, that video of that, that text. On the there. FCA website. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I... I it, it might still be up. I haven't looked at it for a long time, but at the very end of it, you can see that that moment. Uh, and I really encourage all of you to go there. It's a very unique moment in uh, in regulatory um, uh, regulatory market participant, you know, uh, collaboration. <laughs> um, uh, Matt, where do you see uh, open source being uh, useful for you know the FCA moving forward? You know, as you think about the future of of open source, how 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 is the FCA thinking about that? Yeah, so um, obviously there's the digital sandbox where we would be exploring um, different solutions. And we, we, we always encourage open source in terms of that, the development of any of those solutions that go through. Uh, not all of the teams will want to do that. Some of them have proprietary um, technologies that they'd want to use, so they might hold on to that. Uh, so we are kind of a, at least a promoter of open source in that way. Uh, I, I mean, in, in terms of uh, open source that we use internally at the FCA, our, uh, advanced analytics team, which is otherwise known as Subtech, uh, they they do use open source in some of their work that they're doing, um, but they are looking at ways that they can ha maybe be a little bit more open with that global financial innovation network on some of the work that they've been doing in the future, so that we can actually share some of our learnings across the, the that whole community of international regulators. So I guess that's kind of where we're thinking we'd be going in terms of open source, but it's only probably a smaller community within the FCA that are actually using it. It's not, it's, it's not broadened out to the, to the whole wide FCA. I mean, go, go on, Jennifer. Oh, I just wanted to build on that. And I just wanted to make a note because I know that the concept of enterprise wide open source policy can be very daunting, um, even if you believe 100% in the principles and, um, so to Matt's point, I want to call out, there are degrees of open source that you can follow as you are developing your strategy. It doesn't have to be um, fully jumping into that pool. For us, um, for example, even amongst the regulatory community, the CFPB has had a very fruitful collaboration with the FCA. Um, and I would consider those conversations to be open source in nature, just between our two agencies. Likewise, the example that Matt provided, which is um, collaborating in a tech sprint style or similar conversation with one or two specific institutions and allowing them to keep their information proprietary and confidential and um, working with them in that manner um, where they are being um, transparent with us as a regulatory body and vice versa, um, but in a very protected and small bubble. That is a step towards open source. Um, as you bring your regulatory legal community along specifically within uh, regulators, um, giving them some baby steps and proving the value of that relationship will help you work towards that larger open source state. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we at AIR, we like to say, think big, but start small. 
And so uh, we've had an opportunity today to really see how regulators are, uh, you know, really engaging in innovation and using technology innovation in terms of not only understanding what they need to regulate, but also integrating new technology into how they regulate and being able to do a better job of regulation. I think the promise of, uh, of technology innovation for regulators is lowering the costs for all of the different parties involved and improving the outcomes of what we want regulation to be and what we want regulation to be able to, to manage. Um, you know, Ian, I wonder uh, if we could, you know, use this as an opportunity to shamelessly plug the SIG and the work that we're hoping to do at the special interest group. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what we're here for, isn't it? So obviously, what, what, we, what we want is um, individuals coming together who have got expertise and, uh, and really right trying to drive uh, open source nature. And I think what, what I I've observed in the kind of past year or two is that it's becoming ever more progressive in the industry. We are beginning to see financial institutions and we've seen today that like the Deutsches, um, Goldman Sachs and other institutions are progressively moving to open source um, um, and putting it on platforms such as Finos. And I think the opportunity for us to, to do more of this is, is, is here now. And I think this is a great group um, and hopefully we will get more members that are looking to join it that have the same view as us to really move this, this forward as an industry because we, we truly believe that open source regulators don't set regulation for one institution, they set it for multiple institutions. We as an industry need to work together closer together and we need to be more open if we're really going to progress. Which is just great. So, uh, you know, if you walk away from this session with one key learning, it is definitely that regulators are engaged in the conversation around innovation and how to use technology to drive that innovation. Um, I want to remind you that the uh, next session is Jennifer Lassiter and her colleagues from the CFPB. So please uh, join them if you want to hear about the history of open source at uh, the CFPB, which is a fascinating story. Uh, I also want to remind you that our next uh, meeting for the SIG on uh, RegTech is going to be on Tuesday, November 24th at 12 noon uh, ET, uh, Eastern Time, and you can go ahead and get information or sign up for that through the GitHub uh, link. But um, uh, uh, essentially, uh, we are really excited, Ian and I are really excited to host the SIG, and we really encourage participation. Um, uh, if you want to be a troublemaker like us, Come join us on Tuesday, November 24th. <laughs> <laughs> and a big thank you to uh, Matt and Jennifer uh, as well for uh, sharing their insights on, on the tech sprints and open source. It's been like very valuable. I re really appreciate Matt, any closing notes? Yeah, I was just going to do my own shameless plug, if that's all right, David. Um, Absolutely. If you, if you want to get involved in the Digital Sandbox pilot, uh, you just have to go to www.digitalsandbox.co.uk um, so digitalsandboxpilot.co.uk uh, and then you can you, I mean anybody can register uh, you can see some of the features that we're, we're looking to explore and um, that's kind of like a, a it's an evolution of our thinking in terms of where we're trying to push um, innovation within the FCA. Which is just great. Jennifer any closing thoughts? I was just going to say thank you. It is always a pleasure to join these brilliant minds and have this conversation. Um, and I'm always humbled by the number of people that I see in the audiences, the curiosity that remains um, when we have a discussion around this topic. It gives me great hope um, for the future. And we haven't lost a single participant, which is amazing. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who are interested in learning more about tech sprints, uh, the FCA has a, a really great paper on uh, innovation and uh, the role that tech sprints play in innovation. So I strongly recommend that you look that up. And AIR, the Alliance for Innovative Regulation, we have a tech sprint manual, which is more of a tactical how-to production guide for regulators on how to produce uh, tech sprints. So uh, with that, Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time today. We hope this was really valuable and we hope that you enjoy the rest of your time at OSSF. Thank you, David. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye, friends.